Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ethics Experts. I'm your host, Giovanni Gallo, co-CEO of Compliance Line, and we're excited to bring you this show today. We got a great guest for you today. Byron Earnhardt is joining us from North Mississippi. Byron, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Giovanni. Great. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. Glad you're here. Um, so want to welcome everyone to the show. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you guys tuning in and listening or, or watching us. And if you are a subscriber, I just want to say super glad that you're joining us today. And hey, everyone else who's not a subscriber, that's what you get on The Ethics Experts. If you subscribe, you get an extra special welcome at the beginning of every show. So hit subscribe, share it with your friends, and let's continue to make the world a better workplace. Um, Byron, thanks for joining us today. Super uh, excited to jump in and talk about ethics and banking um, and a bunch of different topics. Uh, just to start out, this is The Ethics Experts. We tell the personal stories of people in the ethics industry. Um, so tell us your personal story. Tell us your path, your career path, and how you got to where you are today. Oh, thanks, man. Um, yeah, um, I guess I could say I've always kind of grown up in a bank. Um, my dad, uh, we grew up, the family is from, he grew up here in the same town that I live in, a little, little town called Tunica, Mississippi, about an hour south of Memphis, Tennessee, straight down Highway 61. Um, my dad went to work for a bank uh, when he came back to farm, actually. And um, he, he farmed for one year with his father and brother. Um, there was a bad cotton cotton prices kind of took a hit and my mom, my mom told him, you know, find a new wife or find a new job. And so he went to work for a bank, um, to quote, ride the cotton prices out. And after 48 years, he just retired from that bank. Oh, wow. Still waiting on the cotton price. Yeah. So just, still just waiting. Uh, <laughs> we're waiting on the cotton prices to rebound. And so I, I grew up in a bank the same way that many people grow up in the, the, the family business. Mm. Um, so I fought it for a while um, and uh, went to work, went to school, University of Tennessee at Knoxville, uh, studied finance. Um, and then I graduated in 2002, right as WorldCom and Enron ah. were, uh, were starting. And the demand for a financial analyst, you know, at, at the time you think you can rule the world, um, the demand was null and void. Mm -hmm. So I went back to work at the bank to do something in my field. And like my dad, here I am 20 something years later or 19 years later, still uh, working around banking. So, okay. uh, yeah, I, I think as we talked about really the way I kind of rec reconcile that with my younger self, uh, I, I do, I play music, write songs for a little label here in Memphis. Or in Memphis. And so I always tell myself that I'm a, a songwriter, a blues guitar player, a, a solo act, that just moonlights as a banker. So that's how I reconcile that <laughs> with, uh, to my younger self. Yeah. Uh, so I, I feel better about myself now that I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> so. We got we, we to gotta answer to that younger self and say, hey, you know, what, what are you doing with your life? And like, this is our exactly. life. And here's what we're doing with it. <laughs> exactly. So calm down, 20 year old Byron. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. You still bang on a guitar a, yeah. a good bit. So. And you're still pretty cool, Byron. I, you know, I, I tell myself that there's a funny meme. There's a funny meme. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's the fines. And there's some of y'all probably don't know who the fines is, but there's a picture of the fines and he's all cool. He says, how I view myself. The next one is how my kids view me. And oh. it's Henry Winkler and like <laughs> ultimate dad gear. Yeah. You know? And I was like, this is, this is my life. Yeah. This is who I am. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> that self-perception is a lot more important than what those kids think. What do they know? Absolutely. That's what I tell them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell them what do they know. Yeah, you don't um, know anything, boy. <laughs> um, so uh, just as we're getting warmed up here, Byron, tell me a little bit about the Barrett School of Banking, what you guys do, what your mission is, and you know how you guys make an impact. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been associated with the Barrett School uh, kind of around the fringes before I started working for like 17 years uh, of my life and then went to work uh, for Barrett about four years ago. And what Barrett School is, it's a graduate school of banking. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, what, what, what idea is that? That is a, typically they're nonprofits that put on a three-year program that is, is at the graduate level in terms of the, the, the type of content, how deep mm -hmm. that content goes into banking. And there's, there's five or six of us across the country that provide that level of uh, 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 banking education. Uh, the thing about Barrett is that Barrett is the only one that has the largest endowment of uh, of any of the banking schools uh, paul barrett was a banker in, in memphis 
um, he passed away. One of our regents went to the uh, the administrator uh, of the trust, hoping to get five, asking for five, hoping to get three. We ended up with eight million. Oh, and so what that awesome, right? Yeah. And but what that allows us to do is it allows us to subsidize the cost of our programming okay. to reach out to smaller banks uh, all over the country, and so we provide the same level of education that. Um, you could get at, a, at another graduate school. A lot of it's the same teachers, sure. um, but it allows for us to do that at a price point that, uh, you know, that, that helps smaller, particularly smaller bankers, given that interest rates are so low, margins are compressed. We can do that. We can help train their bankers. And in terms of like our mission, what we've really tried to do is focus exclusively on almost exclusively on, on community banks. Those oh, that are, um, those that are in on Main Street, those that are, you know, the the corner store bank in little small town America. We do work with some larger banks. Very, very glad to have them because they need the education too. But sure. we've been able to sort of take that mission and take that passion that we have for, uh, you know, community banks. And we're the only endorsed graduate school by the ICBA, which is the National Community Banking Trade Association, Independent okay. Community Bank of America. And also it picked up the endorsement of about 12 state associations from all the way from Washington state to Virginia. Um, so we really view ourselves, we've got a passion for community banks, for that local banker that he or she knows their communities, getting involved with it, providing credit, really understanding financial intermediation and how that works in the community, yeah. which is really locally focused, but been able to expand that across the country. Sure. Um, you could tell I get, we get really fired up about that. So we have a lot of, in a lot, in addition to where I think we're coming into uh, with this, in addition to the graduate school, we do a lot of different programming all the way from teaching, you know, the basic fundamentals of the financial statements to compliance. We're getting ready. I'm, as soon as we get off this, I've got to go work on our compliance program. Oh. Um, so we work on, we, we stay in touch and keep our fingers on the pulse of really everything that impacts banking especially compliance, given that it is such a huge part of, uh, of the banking industry. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I love that community bank angle. Um, you know, it's, it, it's cool because it almost feels like you as a school are a little bit closer to that end, end point impact, right? Like cha- training somebody at an, a national or international bank that it goes through 18 levels before it gets to, you know, uh, the lender or, you know, the borrower or whatever. Um, uh, you're a little bit closer to that. That's pretty cool. So you said, yeah, this- and, and, oh, it's, and, and, and a lot of times those larger banks, I mean, some of it's just the practicality of it too, sure. um, is because those larger banks have their own internal training. Whereas, right. and you're talking about a, you know, close to a you know, hundred billion dollar bank, right. they're going to be able to afford their own training. A hundred million dollar bank, however, does not. And I know those numbers sound big, but, no. um, but they, uh, if you, yeah, if you're not familiar with banking, but yeah, right they're not able to afford the, the the level of training maybe that another bank twice their size or five, five times their size, which would still be sort of a small mid-sized bank. Right. Um, and quite frankly, there's more of those hundred million dollar banks than there are the hundred billion dollar banks. Yeah, to be exactly. honest. Uh-huh, yeah. So there's a little bit of a practical side to it as well, but man, yeah, I mean, it is being able to reach out and work with people who are that many people across the country who are point of the sphere working in these communities is really, really cool. That's really, awesome. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you're passionate about it and I love it. Um, so, you know, um, we're going to get into some things about ethics and DEI and ESG and stuff like that. But, you know, just to kind of tie it into banking, there's this really interesting point that you brought up about banking that, you know, maybe not more than anywhere else, but, you know, certainly at a high level, ethics is tied into the business, right? Sure. You, like you need to have ethical actions, you, you know, reputation is very important. And you said this great thing that, you know, banks hold people sweat equity and for them to survive and, you know, serve, they need to be able to hold that and lend that out well throughout the economy. Um, Tell me a little bit about that and how ethics ties into that. Yeah. um, Yeah. I teach banking in uh, for a little liberal arts school here in Memphis. And I I tell my bankers, you know, you'll, you'll hear the, uh, the idea that interest, that interest compounding interest is like the eighth wonder of the world. I make the argument that financial intermediation is the ninth and banks are right at the middle of that because Mm. we're able to take, uh, we're able to take 
people's blood, sweat, and tears as represented by their money, yeah. people's paychecks, their savings accounts, things like you know, extra money they have laying around if they, you know, fortunate enough to have some, um, they're able to put that money in a bank, feel secure uh, about that. And then we are, then the banks are then able to lend that out into building new homes, starting new businesses, uh, buying, you know, buying that student their first car to go to school, helping them buy their first computer um, to, to take to school. Um, all those things really only happen because of financial intermediation, which yeah. is the, to not bore your listeners, it's the people that, people that net savers, people that have money, they put money into a bank and the bank lends that out. Uh-huh. And so there's somebody in the middle making that happen. Um, so if you think about it in that model, the bank's reputation and the way that the bank is a corporate entity and quite frankly, the way the banker, the reputation that they have, as you all know, that's really hard to build mm. and very easy to blow up. And so it's imperative that uh, a bank maintains a good reputation, acts in ethical banners. And look, I am, I am not Pollyanna about it. There are some bankers out there in this world that don't, and they need sure. to be shut down. And, you know, it would make our industry a lot better, make the economy a lot better. Um, but at the same time, we have to live that way on the individual level as well. You know, what we were talking about uh, before the before you hit record, um, you know, it is such a relationship business that if the banker does not have a good reputation in town. Remember, we're dealing with a lot of small town USA here in this, sure. and even in larger cities. If that banker does not have a good reputation, um, it reflects poorly on them and it reflects poorly on the bank and therefore financial intermediation is really, really hard to get into. Yeah. Uh, why would you trust that person? Right. Plain and simple. You know, plain, plain and simple. If, if they've got a bad reputation, and look, many of them do. If you've got a bad reputation and you were perceived to be sort of a, <laughs> the technical term being sleaze bucket, then, <laughs> you, uh, then if you proceed that way, it's hard to do business and the public loses their trust in you. Right. And that's, that could really impede your ability to do business. Yeah. I, I love that you bring it up that way because I think a lot of times in the GRC or compliance and ethics profession, we're talking a lot about these things from some form of distance, right? We talk about the tone at the top and we talk about how people perceive compliance or what it's like when, you know, you send this message out and, you know, broadcast it to 80,000 employees. But at the heart of it is this thing that you're talking about, Byron, where it's a personal reputation, right? And uh, a division in a company can have a reputation. The leader, you know, the leadership, you know, capital L leadership can have a reputation. But at the end of the day, it's a person, right? Like what I, what, one of the things I love most about ethics is it's focused on people. This is not moving Mm. ones and zeros. This is not, you know, building widgets that, you know, you know, fasteners for a bridge. This is all about people. And at the end of the day, this is about a person making a decision about another person to trust them or to allow them to lead them or to follow their direction that, you know, if I do this thing, then it's going to be better for all of us. And what's cool, Byron, is, you know, at that community bank level, those those kind of person to organization to combined reputation ties are all still pretty close. Right. It's, right. you know, you know, like. You know, it, it may not be exactly this, but it's like, you know, that's so-and-so's bank. It may have a different label on it, but it's this person's bank, and that's the person who's going to make decisions about what happens with my money. And that's really at the core of everything that we're doing. And there's this weird thing going on in our economy and in, you know, industry writ large where it's it's almost like it's coming full circle where mm-hmm. it kind of started out, you know, this is kind of my thesis, so uh, beat me up on this if you like, Byron. But, you know, it started out where everyone was in a town and you knew the candlestick maker and the baker and the shoemaker and, you know, uh, the doctor and all of that. You knew them. You knew their families and all of that. Well, companies have grown and, you know, uh, you know, companies are going across state lines and across countries. And, you know, some of them are, you know, have GDPs bigger than other countries and stuff. And it kind of got very disentangled and it was just kind of this this facade of like, you know, the, the, the big cold logo of the company, but we're, you know, I feel like we're coming full circle where people are like, 
well, you should be responsible for your actions no, no matter how big you are. And there are people that are impacted by your actions, and there are also people driving those actions. So that's what I feel like ethics and compliance and GRC and ESG is about is like putting the human back in these relationships that, you know, whether you pay through an app or you send in a paper check or whatever, it's still about people trusting and interacting with other people. Now, I wouldn't beat you up on that. Um, I wouldn't, not at all. Uh, I wouldn't beat you up on that at all. Um, the, uh, it, and I know <laughs> the bankers that are listening to this are probably going to sh- turn tune out um, <laughs> because, you know, bankers, yes, you know, compliance is a huge part of what we do. A lot of times bankers do feel that there's a little bit of overreach in terms of the, sure. uh, in, in terms of the regulation. And, you know, they haven't, you know, the, the regulators have not found a process that they can't infuse with a ton of paperwork, yep. which takes time. I mean, and so look, I, I'm the first to, to side with my banking uh, brothers and sisters on, yes, there is definite some overreach that has made the process hassle. way more, way more complicated than it needs to be. That being said, there are some regulations that do sort of keep us that that sort of incent banks to uh, act the way like what you're talking about. Things like the CRA Community Reinvestment Act that prevents mm-hmm. redlining. Uh, it makes banks get credit for taking some of their their time, their efforts, and their money, reinvesting it back into the community in terms of financial education. I've, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. I've seen that work in the mm-hmm. lives of uh, my town. We live in a low to moderate income area, and so uh-huh. you've got a lot of need for, for that. It's the banks leading the way for that. Um, there's a lot, you know, we can, there is a way to dress up a loan with and put in a bunch of fees and dress the interest rate up. Up that you know, if there were no regulations like truth and lending, um, mm-hmm. you know, it would make it tempting to 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 do that. So yeah, I think there are there is room for that, and I like the way you put that in terms of it being about the people. Yeah. Um, because at, at at the heart of it, banking brethren and sister, I, I understand what I understand the feeling you're going to get with this, but it is about the people and protecting them, but also sort of guiding the bank to. To, to do the things that need to be done and mm-hmm. providing the, the rail guards, like in bowling, when, when I bowl, I have to put the guards <laughs> up, um, you know, providing them to say, look, we all want to get towards the end goal. We all want to do right, but let's put the rails up to keep you out of the, uh, out of the ditch. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there is room for it. And again, it can go too far. The paperwork becomes intense, but at the heart of it, that really does get back to, uh, making making it a people business and, and yeah. interacting with our customers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I like the way you put that because, listen, a lot of these regulations and the red tape and the forms and all of that, it's it's a hassle, right? It's just it's just right. how it is. It's a hassle. But, you know, I think there are two sides of it. Some of it, like, avails some things that are good, right? CRA is a good mm-hmm. thing. Let's push that make it easier for me to say yes sure. to that. And then on the other side, it's, you know, I mean, I kind of think of it like these, regu- you know, if I'm a good guy, well, I don't need the regulations because I'm probably not going to, you know, mess somebody over or do something wrong. But it's kind of like, well, if we're part of this community, uh, if we're part of this profession and some people need these guardrails, I need to kind of agree to those so that the worst people don't make something really bad. Right. It's kind of like, you know, if imagine that I were ever to get pulled over for speeding, um, you know, I would probably be like, well, yeah, but I was doing it safely. You should pull someone else else over because they're they're violating this in a bad way, right? Like I think we feel that way when we're complying with some of these regulations. Like I don't need to do this. I don't need you to force me to be honest and have integrity and have have ethics, right? There's some of these things that like, well, you know what? This is kind of unnecessary for me, but we've got to realize that like it's got to be kind of, you know, equal across the board because when that thing happens, it can have a catastrophic impact, not just on the bank and the reputation and their assets, but their lenders and maybe the entire industry um, in, you know, how trust people, how trustworthy people think, you know, bankers writ large are. Yeah, well, and, and I think to to that point, you, I think there's, for the banking perspective, that argument that, oh, I don't need this because I'm never going to act, I'm never going to act unethically. Uh, fails to understand and look I, and, and, and I, I come from it so I understand that mindset mindset but that that assumes that your customer knows as much as you do about mm. financial products and financial management and things like that that's a big assumption okay. and it's 
largely not true. Uh -huh. So I, when I was in management, I would tell my, my bankers uh, and those that were open up accounts, look, yes, it's a lot of paper. Yes. It kind of is a pain in the, you know, where mm -hmm. to, to, to sit down and walk somebody through this, but take advantage of that time to build the relationship. Okay. They're going to tell you, you know, Hey, you know, if, Giovanni, yeah, I got all that. I know how interest rates work. Cool. More times than not, they don't know how it works. And if you're the banker that walks them through to take the time to, to, to your point, it's why I think it's a great point about compliance and ethics being about the people. Yeah. Take the time to do a little education because the whole content marketing thing that's been going on right now is centered on educating and, and engaging with our customers, yep. freemium information that helps them out in life. And, yep. you know, that's one of the things I think the millennials have taught us to do um, is, is to, to that kind of approach. Look, do it at the desk when you're opening up a checking account, when they're talking about, a, look, mortgages are complicated as they can be, even sure. for bankers. When you're at the closing of a mortgage, take the time to walk them through the disclosures and take the time to understand that, look, you know, when you pay this, your taxes are going to be taken care of your insurance. We're, we're going to take care of all that. Oh, yeah. more, more times than not. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. More time. And, and see, they escrow is something they don't understand, but you explain it to them and say, Hey, look, we're going to help you take care of this. Or, you know, when you, um, the, the explain to them equity, look, this is a, this is the first lien. And we, if you never need a second lien, we can help take the time to educate them. Um, because like nine times out of 10, and that's anecdotal, but nine sure. times out of 10, um, they don't know as much as you think they do. Mm -hmm. They're looking to you as the, as the expert. Yep. So those disclosures are a perfect time. Don't blow them off with, you got to sign this. And, you know, yeah. so my boss doesn't get mad. Take the time <laughs> to educate them about what's going on. Uh, because most of the time you're not going to get any put nobody nobody's going to get any pushback for you actually showing care and time and effort nobody's yeah. going to push back on that right that's great i love how you put that take that time use you know whatever you're being quote unquote forced to do through compliance yeah. to build that relationship build and educate you know educate your customer your client or whoever that's awesome Absolutely. and you know i think that 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 those kind of little deposits those little actions um end up building reputation and relationship and we we're talking earlier about how important that reputation is whether mm. it's a massive bank that everyone knows when they see the logo what that means and you know has heard the you know seen the ceo on cnbc or something or the local bank where you know if you drive 20 miles away no one knows what it is that reputation is important right and Huge. um you and i were talking a little bit about you know the this concept of like a banker needing to be clean cut as a representation of how trustworthy they are, not that you have to fit this mold, but you have to deliver some message to the people you work with, you know, in how, whether it's through an ad or, you know, shaking your hand when they walk in the door, that you are a reliable person. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I, and this, this kind of gets into, uh, you know, a, a lot of stereotypes that aren't true and probably don't need to be true, but they are. Okay. Um, it's, it's why you, you see a lot of bankers is sort of, clean cut, button down, uh, people, not that. And look, I, I, like I said, I'm a songwriter, blues guitar player. <laughs> I wish I was a rock star at heart, Yeah, but you know, it, 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 and this isn't a fair statement. I fully admit that, but if, you know, the people that want to put, if you were going to put your, if people are going to put their money and their blood, sweat and tears into a bank, they tend to feel better if there's a, a representation that exudes conservative, not political, but uh, not necessarily political, yeah, but a conservative, safe, um, you know, you're not going to go run off to Bermuda with my money. Here it is. Right. Now, not that, you know, we talked about the you know, face tattoos, pony, all that. There, there are people that have run off, that have ran off to Bermuda with other people's money that look just like me, short hair, button down shirt. Exactly. And there's great bankers with ponytails and, and tattoos. Yeah, right. So it's not, it does it's not, not play that out. Thing. It's not just the face of it, but you're trying to convey the heart of it. But you have to convey that. And, and you know, it's, it, that, but what you're conveying is at some level, your, your ethics, your moral, your morals, your, the way you conduct business. Mm -hmm. Um, is what's being conveyed in there. Again, any kind of any kind of assumption like that is based on in some ways based on some misunderstandings, but sure, that is sort of the, the reality of the world too. 
Yeah, but ultimately, I think the point of it is you're, you know, you can convey this by the way you answer an email or how sure. you greet somebody at the door or, Absolutely. you know, how much, like you said, you take the time to explain this stuff. You're, mm -hmm. you know, like all of that stuff. And it may be the way you tie your tie or whatever it is. Um, sure. But you're trying to convey that, you know what, like we're on the same team. I'm concerned about your well-being. I know how to do my job. I'm a professional at this. And, Absolutely. you know, let's let's do this thing together, whether it's, you know, lending, borrowing, you know, checking. Whatever sure. It is. I like that. Yeah, let's do this thing together. I'm like, you know, let's let's do this. And it's so reflective of the community, which is why community banking is so important. Right. You know, it, it's so reflective of the community and uh, being able to being able to project that. Beginning out in the community, going to the football games, going to the soccer games, mm -hmm. shopping locally, all that fit factors into it. Sure. Um, so, you know, sticking on that point of reputation, you talked about how potentially, you know, maybe more than the average company or something like that reputation for a bank is really important because of the potential shocks from macro and the leverage that they have and stuff like that. Um, talk to us a little bit about this because I think a lot of people outside of banking see the regulations that are in banking and see all the red tape and think that, you know, maybe it's idiosyncratic or that's just what regulations are. But, you know, this having a reputation as an ethical organization or person um, may matter more to a bank than other companies. And there may be something for other companies to learn from them on how they handle those things because there's some of that leverage and macro trends and stuff like that that's at place in any company. Sure. Um, and I'm glad you said it like that, Giovanni. The, um, you look at a bank's financial statement, um, and I, I had a lending professor, uh, a lending teacher tell me, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic. Banks are so highly levered just because of the way we account for deposits and loans and things like that. Banks are so highly levered. And yet when we lend people money, we get onto them about their leverage. <laughs> a little secret of the industry there. But a yeah. uh, little finance joke for the listeners there. Oh. The, um, yeah, sorry about that. The, <laughs> um, uh, you know, but because we are so highly levered and like I said, I, I look at financial intermediation as the ninth wonder of the world. Mm. Let's let's take a look at that process, and if it fails, the impact in the economy. So, <clears throat> you got a bank in a community, um, and people are putting their blood, sweat, and tears into that as represented by the money. That bank is then lending it out and providing credit, and then living on the spread. And that's fundamentally what fundamentally what banking is. Yeah. If that bank becomes for whatever reason, perception or or or, or justified, uh, viewed to be uh, unethical, just sleaze buckets. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen is the people that are putting the money in the bank, they're going to stop or pull, you know, or even worse, pull their money out of the bank. Look what happens from a macro perspective. That there's no credit for there's no credit for small businesses that impacts paychecks. There's no houses being built. That has a huge impact on on, uh, on the economy. Now multiply it, it's on and on and on and on. Now multiply that out across four thousand community banks. Oh, six five thousand banks in general across the whole country. Reputation is sort of the strong. And look, it's kind of scary when you think about it. Reputation of the banking industry is sort of one of the glues that sort of holds this whole thing together. Right. Um, I don't know if I, I don't, I agree with you that it is, it's important for all companies. It's really important with banking. Yeah. It's really, and it has a huge impact at a macroeconomic level. Uh, if that's not there, not just to, and look, the wall street banks and big banks, you know, when they act they're, they're, they have their role and when they act up for, you know, from, but um, if, if that reputation is, is harmed at the industry and even at the, at the, corporate level, that has an impact it's, uh, on some economy and it, it, it could be disastrous for everybody. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, some economy is, it has an impact on people and their lives and their livelihood yeah. and their ability to feed their family or send their kids to college or enjoy the fruits sure. of their labor or whatever it is. Sure. And, and even the, there's a psychological impact. I mean, if you're, if I've got my money in one bank, all the blood, sweat and tears, you know, from my job that I do the 60, 40, 60, whatever that is, I put my money into a sleaze bucket. I got to go find a new place. Well, how do I do the new place? It's going to be a sleaze bucket too. Right. That has some psychological uh, impact to say nothing of the macro impact. Yeah. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper. You, you and I were talking a little bit about how this concept of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and ESG is coming to banks 
but you know they're they're maybe kind of waiting to see to be led into a, a a little bit more. Tell me kind of what that looks like and what your view on on those topics is. Uh, first, my view I think is probably too it, it's too it, not too little too late, but it, it's long overdue. I'll say okay. for uh, for the banks, um, we have tended to be uh, an industry dominated by uh, white males, older white males. Mm-hmm. Um, there is like in any industry. Uh, there is a pay discrepancy between uh, largely across the industry, uh, male and female. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am not going to, I'm not going to defend what has happened in the past because I think it's wrong. Sure. Um, However, I I do, we are starting to see that in in our regulations, in our exams, that uh, the government is going to start looking at ESG and DEI uh, as part of our lending process, making sure that we're working on uh, and working with ethical companies and lending money to them. Now, what that looks like, we don't know. Sure. Uh, And then also the way that the bank conducts its own business. We're really waiting on what that looks like. Um, that's a really good idea at the 30,000 foot level. Yeah. What does that mean for, for banks? We really don't know. We're kind of waiting to, to see what that looks like. Um, you know, I don't, the, the you know, waiting to see, you know, every two years we change governments and change regulations yeah. and you know, the, 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 those that make the rules. So some of that's probably going to have to come after a 22 or 24 okay. election. And then whatever the government looks like at that point, that said, we don't know um, what that looks like. My guess is, and this is my view only, uh, you know, this, my view does not represent the, uh, the banking. Um, I, I do. This is not financial I think, advice. No, this is not financial <laughs> advice. Don't, Lord, don't, don't, don't take my financial advice. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I do, I think we're going to be having to look at, uh, you know, our, our, particularly on the DEI side, I think we're going to have to look at, uh, our, our pay scales, our pay differentials. Okay. Uh, and I think our hiring practices are going to be, are going to be examined probably need to be, definitely need to be in some cases. Um, but not only that, not ma- and making sure that we're not only saying the right things, but doing the right things. And look, again, that kind of comes back to your reputation. And, you know, bankers do tend to be uh, pretty, you know, safe, conservative people. And so it kind of comes back to, well, that doesn't apply here. Mm regardless of whether or not you agree with the regulation and that's a different argument than the regulations coming and you got to comply with it anyway, your, your okay. opinion on the matter really is interesting, but probably <laughs> irrelevant. Yeah. Um, so I, that I really think I'm beginning to see that happening. So your, um, you know, your, your own politics is great and, and understand you do, you do, you do you. But those that are making the rules are probably getting ready to change some of those. So okay. it's time to start. It's time to start thinking about uh, your your DEI, your ESG, in terms of not only what you're saying, uh, how you're looking at that from the lending side, and how, mm-hmm. what you're actually doing in the bank, um, yeah. and looking at those pay scales, looking at those differentials, and, and addressing those. Um, yeah, and I, I really wish I had more. And you and I had talked about it before. I wish I had more to say. Oh, we're definitely going to be doing X, Y, Z. Yeah, just wait. We just hadn't, we just hadn't gotten it yet, and yeah. so any anything that's being talked about is really sort of uh, more at the corporate level, or this is what we think is going to be, but we don't know what that looks like. We yeah. don't know what that looks like, but it's coming. And again, like I said, whether you like it or not, it, it's it's coming at some level and to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an interesting perspective and a lot of industries are dealing with, with it Mm -hmm. right now. Like what does ESG mean? Well, it means uh, environment, social and governance, but what does it mean for us? Right. What are we supposed to do with it? Um, And you know, you're, you're starting to see kind of murmurings and the SEC has some comments about it, but not strict guidance on it and stuff like that. And, you know, it's happening, you know, well, that's just for public companies. Well, it's going to spread, you know, my thesis is it's going to spread, you know, this need to not just be doing things, not just not, not just avoiding getting thrown in jail for malfeasance, but showing that you're doing the right thing by tracking, reporting metrics and getting better at it. I think that that whether it's diversity, equity, inclusion, environment, social governance, that, you know, this is something that's coming out and rolling out with more and more formality throughout the the economy. And I think that people, you know, 
I think that there's potential to, you know, there are kind of a couple layers to it, right? You can just wait until you're forced to do it or like you're going to get locked up and thrown in jail and your and your company be shut down. You can wait and get started then. Uh, you can take a step into it and say, hey, you know what? This is a defensive maneuver because I know in the next five years we're going to have to do something. Let's make sure that we're not scrambling in year four when it comes out and let's start tracking some stuff right now, kind of do it on our own terms, kind of have a plan in place and we don't have to, you know, we're not going to have whatever, the, the third quarter of 2023 thrown off because this thing comes out, we're going to get prepared for it. And then, you know, there's the the third layer of it. You know, I call this the compliance version 3.0 layer is, you know what? there's benefit to the company, there's benefit to our mission to make sure we're being fair to people, we're treating people well. And you know what? If you run the numbers and you're already great at it, then you can say, hey, you know what? We're strong here and you don't have anything to explain. Um, But, you know, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, having good governance makes your business run better. You know, like performing well on these social metrics of you're not discriminating against people because they're from this town or they grew up this way or they have this background or whatever it is, you know, to leave aside, you know, kind of the big things that people talk about, gender and race and stuff like that. You know, just being equitable to people probably creates a good culture and a place where people can focus on the work instead of seeing if someone is going to stab them in the back or something like that. You know, that's kind of that third Absolutely. label. You you know, you can do the, you know, I'll do it if it keeps me out of jail. You can do the, hey, you know what, Get let's get started on it and we can do it on our own terms or you can do it because it's right. But, you know, regardless, I think probably in the next five years you're going to be doing it. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think it's even if you don't have the direction, I, I, we always tell banks, look, I get the examiners. I get the regulators. They're seen as the antagonist. Um, and in a lot of, and, and in fairness, sometimes they present themselves to be that way. Yeah. Be the relationship manager with them as well uh-huh. and begin that dialogue of, look, I know y'all don't have any directives on this, or if mm-hmm. you do, can you give me a heads up on it? Or, you know, or can you, can you tell me a little bit about what we need to be doing? Having those conversations early to your point of being a little bit more proactive on it. I will say this too. There has been some talk about uh, making sure that our, our our commercial loans, loans to our business to businesses, that we monitor their ESG uh, mm. and that as part of the credit underwriting. Right. What concerns me with that is I'm not, yeah, uh, ESG. I, I, I like it, it's a good idea. Sure. How do you measure from a risk perspective? How do you measure that? Yeah, and how do you tie <laughs> that, that to goes, loan performance? Yeah, well, it, it, how do you tie that with loan performance? How do you know? How am I supposed to, uh, as a as a lender, make sure that their board of directors who have nothing to do with the loan at the, at the underwriting level? It's just to, they do it to some extent, but sure. um, you know that they're. I've got to monitor that. I don't. I don't know how that works. We do a lot with the environment. Again, this may shock people, but when we make a a large enough loan that a lot of times the regulators will require us to do an environmental study. Sure. You can argue about its efficacy and all that, but we are it's something part, of, part, of, yeah, part of the, uh, that underwriting process, particularly for like gas stations. Oh Lord. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had deals blow up because of hundred year old gas tanks. So sure, underneath sure. It. But I, there's all those impacts that would be out there. So I think if that's sort of the metric for the, for the E uh-huh. for, for, for the E on that, we kind of already do that. Yeah. But in terms of its societal, our customer societal impact and their governance structure, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah. I, I don't know how you're going to quantify that. Yeah. And you know, I tend to think that we'll figure it out, so to speak. Right. Like, you know, you got to, as with anything, right. Like if your bank is just starting to lend to, you know, commercial real estate for housing, you got to mm-hmm. kind of get into it and learn it and figure out what the metrics are and learn from your peers. And then, you know, you know, I don't know, in three to five years, you have a zone of excellence and you know how to lend to multifamily housing or something, right? Like sure. you got to get into it to learn it, to perform on it, and then make it something that you're good at. So I, th- you know, I think a- as we kind of head toward wrapping up here, I think there's this interesting dynamic on these things, DEI, ESG, pick your alphabet soup, where it's like, well, it's not really clear. No one's telling me what to do. Well, you know what? I mean, we're in business. We're people. We have brains and we have hearts. And we're like part of why people have jobs is you're you got to figure something out. Right. It's not just, you know, spend time inside a building. Um, So we got to figure out problems. And I think on this stuff, the the interesting thing is this has a chance, you know, call it the ESG movement writ large, has a chance to have a little bit of a different tag on it that it's more ethics than just compliance. It's more Mm -hmm. let's figure out this thing that is not just keeping us out of jail, not just forced on us because, you know, the, uh, you know, the federal government made this regulation, but you know what, when we do this, it has a bunch of positive externalities, 
externalities. It helps, you know, it helps us run our business better. It's cleaner. You know, we're not caught, getting caught up in the mud as much. You know, our employees l- like it. Our, you know, customers and, you know, borrowers like it and stuff like that. It It's going to take some figuring out. And like I said, you can wait until, you know, you're at risk of getting thrown into jail to get started on it. Or you can get started now and realize, all right, we're, we're doing some of that. Okay, we can track some of this and see, you know, if over the next two years I can see some correlation in my loan performance based on people who are doing this and start learning about it so that when it becomes official – Hopefully you're ahead of the pack and you have a better reputation and you have, uh, you know, better returns on your loan portfolio or, you know, better, um, you know, interaction with your customers because of it. Um, but it, it takes a little bit of that foresight and leadership to say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to make, you know, a massive press release and say that our whole company is doing all of these things in the next three months, but we're going to start working on it, trying to figure it out because, There, you know, it's a challenge that's coming. It's something that we probably should do. It probably should help our reputation and it's going to take some time to figure it out. Absolutely. Uh, um, It's going to be interesting to see, I think, from a risk management perspective, what those analytics end up looking like Uh um, and how we track those. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said, I'm still not sure what those individual, and that's what I mean, what those individual metrics are going to be and how we would track those. But I think it's an interesting academic at this point i think it'd be an interesting academic study but absolutely to your point don't sit around and wait for it to drop on right. you go and start doing even if it's wasted effort quote i'm doing air right. yeah you wasted can't, you effort can't see it return within this month yeah if, even if it's quote wasted effort and whatever the metrics are aren't what you're doing you did something and talk to your regulators and you did something that to, to, to right. start addressing that nobody's going to burn you for, uh, for doing something that was in anticipation of, mm-hmm. uh, an initiative like this, unless you keep doing it and don't match up with what the regulators tell you, but right. uh, nobody's going to burn you for t- being proactive on this. So go be exactly. proactive on it. That's great. Uh, well, this has been great, Byron. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate yeah. you sharing your perspective. I love the reputation bit. I love the, you know, the community banking aspect, which is, you know, you're a little bit closer kind of eyeball to eyeball with people. And, you know, you 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 see that cycle of a decision, you know, impact of reputation and how that mm. impacts your business. You see that more closely tied together. Um, so I love that perspective that, that you've brought. As, as we wrap up, any last words you want to leave with us or you want to tell us when your next blues concert is or what? <laughs> well, I wish I knew when the next blues concert is. No, we actually have our compliance uh, conference coming up, held virtually, on um, coming up next week. We're recording this on October eighteenth, so it's the twenty fifth through the twenty eighth. Cool. Um, and we've got our registration up at our website, Barrett Banking, B A R R E T Banking dot org. Um, but uh, yeah, I wish I had a good blues concert coming up. No, we're going to be looking at. Um, doing some ESG DEI work was talking with, uh, with, uh, another one of our Tweezel brethren on, um, uh, uh Brad Fetterman. And, uh, oh, cool. he's been, he's doing some interesting, uh, DEI ESG stuff. And as we get a little closer to getting some sort of guidance on that, we're going to be doing some, uh, some content around it as well. So stay Great. tuned and follow us on social media to stay informed. All right. Um, but yeah, Sounds so yeah, great. no, it's it, it's coming up and check that out. We'll I'm sure we'll be doing some webinars and some free bits, uh, some free video clips on LinkedIn uh, uh, from the compliance thing. Some of this lending and deposit stuff, money going out, money coming in. Yeah. Uh, some of the ethics uh, around some of the compliance issues around that. Awesome. Well, uh, everyone, stay tuned. Check out uh, the Barrett School of Banking and follow Byron Earnhardt to uh, find out more about this. Uh, interesting perspective, especially from that community banking angle. Um, I'm your host, Giovanni Gallo. This podcast is sponsored by Compliance Line, and we appreciate you joining us today on The Ethics Experts. We'll see you next time. 